Welcome everyone to the Lower Columbia Chapter Ice Age Floods Institute and the Tualatin Heritage uh, Center Tualatin Historical Society. And tonight I'd like to introduce to you Sheila Alfson. Many of you are familiar with her programs. They are just excellent. Tonight she is speaking on Constructing Oregon. She teaches geology at Chemeketa Community College, Lynn Benton, and Portland State University. She did graduate work in paleontology at the University of Oregon, volcanology, oceanography. She has a Master of Arts in Teaching from Western Oregon University, a Bachelor of Arts from Western Oregon University in Geology and Spanish. She's an Oregon resident since 1970, extensively traveled in the US, particularly the Western states, Alaska, Arctic, Iceland, Hawaii, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. And she has been in education for 28 years. So I know we are going to have an excellent program tonight. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to talk to you about my favorite subject, which is constructing Oregon, how Oregon, this beautiful state was put together. Well, uh, when I first, you know, I have always loved a beautiful scenery and nature. Whenever I go anywhere, I just love looking at the natural landscape. And uh, since becoming a geologist, it's even more exciting because not only can I still appreciate it for its beauty, but I understand what's behind it. And so I hope to bring to you tonight some, of, some understanding of, I'm gonna show you beautiful pictures of Oregon. And then later on at the end of the presentation, I have a little film that I put together, uh, which will show you how it all went together piece by piece. So we'll do it in kind of chronological order. And uh, so let's get started. I'm sharing my screen, correct? You can see Constructing Oregon? Yes. Yes, okay. Because uh, it's not giving me the little symbol that it normally does. Okay. Okay, so anyway, let's get going here. Um, Oregon is a puzzle of different physiographic provinces. And um, it, it, it really is a collage. It's not, uh, it's a very exciting state to learn about geology because we have so many different types of features here. And so we can break Oregon into its physiographic provinces. And until we discovered plate tectonics in the mid sixties, we had no idea why this state was such, a, such an interesting collage of different types of rocks. So of course the uh, revolutionary revolution in plate tectonics ex suddenly explained everything about how the earth works and this certainly pertains to Oregon. Okay, so we're gonna start with the oldest province and then work upwards. So the very oldest rocks that we have in Oregon are in the Northeast corner and they are the Blue Mountains. Now the Wallawa Mountains are, are a range in the Blue Mountain region and uh, they're easily one of the most scenic places in Oregon if you've ever been there. They're just uh, beautiful scenery and this is just crying out to me that this is all the result of glaciation. We'll talk about that here. But also in this province it are some local rocks, some rocks that, that uh, so actually, let's go back for just a minute. The rocks in the Blue Mountains are the oldest, and they bear witness to the fact that they are not part of the original North American continent. More on that in a little bit, but keep that in your head. The, the rocks were not formed here. But we do have one region in the Blue Mountains region that is from local rocks, and that's the John Day Formation. Of course, some of you probably realize the John Day Formation has world-class uh, fossils 
And it, it's a variety of different, it's all the result of volcanism. So we'll, we'll explain all this as time goes on. Uh, Oregon has some pretty exotic uh, reptiles. So we have uh, crocodiles, ichthyosaurs, this, this uh, porpoise looking reptile that was uh, living here during the time of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were on earth. These creatures were in the ocean. And uh, the, some of them are very exotic, meaning that they are not native to North America. They, 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 show, uh, they show in their fossil and their bone structure that they're actually more related to the ones in Asia rather than the ones that were native to North America. Okay, so if we look in the late Mesozoic, that would be the time of the, uh, the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, we have we had a, a parade of these microcontinents. We had these little pieces that were coming together. Pangaea was breaking up, and the Atlantic Ocean was opening up. But all these pieces that were coming over that were originally attached to Asia were moving across the ocean on plate tectonics. This was all a mystery until we discovered that the crust of the earth is actually moving like a conveyor belt and moving these pieces over to get attached to North America. More on that in a minute. So the Blue Mountains are accreted terrains. I'm gonna explain that here in a minute, but the other place that is also accreted terrains is the opposite corner of the state, the Klamath Mountains. And the Klamath Mountains are also very old rocks that are exotic. They are not native to North America. Okay, if we look at this uh, collage, this is done, by, these maps were put together by Ron Blakey at Northern Arizona University. And he put together time lapses of what it looked like. So during the early Triassic, that would be uh, the, uh, um, it, the, like I said, the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, you can see what North America looked like, but, but everything that is Oregon didn't exist yet. We had places that were shallow ocean, and then we had these land masses that were on their way moving over by the magic of plate tectonics. They were on a moving tectonic plate, and they're about to collide with North America and become the oldest parts in Oregon. And then the rest of Oregon filled in around it. So to give you an idea of what this process is called, this process is called accretion. And the chunks of land that are moving across the ocean are called terrains. This is different than, uh, the, than the usual spelling of terrain, but it means a chunk of land that is, a, it, that is about to attach. So we see that this process of subduction where one tectonic plate is moving under our tectonic plate that we're on North America here. And it's bringing these pieces of land with it. They're just moving along. They detach from a continent over by Asia and then slowly uh, about four inches a year, they moved towards North America. They're about ready to attach to North America. So this process is called accretion. Okay, we look at the uh, Klamath Mountains and we've got the same situation. The, the rocks here tell us that they're very old and they're not native to North America. They're also metamorphic rocks, which happens when the two land masses collide. You've got a lot of heat and pressure and it takes those igneous rocks and turns them into metamorphic rocks. You look at the beautiful scenery of Atoller Mountain in Josephine County. This was my original home when I moved to Oregon. Spent eight years down in this area and just love it. Uh, also way up in the mountains, this is Bolin Lake. And again, the scenery is just beautiful and the mountains are beautiful, but they just cry out to the geologists that they're not from around here, that they were brought over. Uh, it also hosts, uh, this area also hosts the Oregon Caves. And if you've ever been to the Oregon Caves, they're very different than the, uh, than the limestone caves of, uh, in the central part of the United States. We have some large cavern systems there in the limestone. These are not limestone, these are marble. 
Marble is metamorphic limestone. It used to be limestone, but in that process of cre uh, accretion, it turned into marble. And then marble dissolves under groundwater, just like uh, limestone does, and forms the beautiful Oregon caves. So the Oregon caves are special because they're marble. Another interesting thing about this area, you might have heard of this, is gold country. Here's where we've got a lot of gold. Uh, I actually lived on a gold mining claim when I lived down there. So gold is a big thing. How does that happen? Well, gold is made in a couple different ways, but one way is uh, it, it forms uh, during uh, igneous processes, but it also is dissolved in seawater. Everything, every mineral on earth is dissolved in some quantity in seawater. But we have underneath, uh, the, when Oregon was first beginning, we had lots of spreading centers and we had these hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents have a way of concentrating the gold. So they're sometimes called black smoker vents, but there's not black smoke coming up. This is under the ocean here. This is hot water hot ocean water that's been heated up like a undersea geyser, think of it, and then it's shooting out here. In the process of heating it up, the, what little gold is, is disseminated throughout the water uh, uh, coagulates, and then these areas just, it puts sediments all around here that are just rich in gold. So you'll find, you know, gold nuggets and so forth. We call this an opiolite. An opiolite is a piece of the ocean floor that's been scraped up and pushed onto land. So the gold that we get in, uh, in Oregon is basically from the opiolite. And that was the work of these black smoker vents at the bottom of the ocean. Now, how does that happen? Well, if we look at uh, the process of accretion here, here we have a continent and here we have an oceanic plate that is subducting under. And, uh, and as, as they come together, as, these, as this distance between the two shortens, some of that ocean floor gets scraped up onto land. See this piece here is about ready to join this piece. And so as it does, it push, scrapes up a little bit of that sea floor and pushes it onto land. And then the land mass comes in and covers the whole thing. So buried in the Klamath Mountains are several ophiolites that most notably the Josephine ophiolite, which is the reason for all the gold mining in Oregon. Okay, let's move on to another section. And the section right here in the middle of the state is called the High Lava Plains because it is a series of volcanic eruptions that happened. And so if we look at it here, we, we see an what we call an age progression, meaning that uh, these different, th this is Central Oregon. So you can see Sherman County here, the town of Fossil, Malheur County here, we're right in the cent central part of the state and moving across the high lava plains is a series of volcanic centers, big volcanic eruptions that happen that spread ash everywhere. The oldest one is the Divine Canyon Tuff at 9.7. And then they get progressively younger as you go all the way across. They basically march along the state to where the youngest one is uh, Newberry Volcano, just, just out of bend. So uh, now the result of that was huge, enormous amounts of ash that makes, uh, and then we find out that ash is a wonderful uh, medium for preserving fossils because uh, in order to preserve a fossil, you have to have an event that kills these animals, but then they have to be preserved. They have to be protected from uh, decay and protected from scavengers. And when you bury them in hundreds of feet of ash, uh, it's a, just a wonderful medium for preserving fossils. So this is, uh, this is the source of the John Day ash uh, that, that makes the John, now the John Day is in the Blue Mountains, but yet the ash came from the high lava plains. 
Another interesting thing here is uh, there, uh, we have uh, Fort Rock. Some of you might have visited it. It's what we call a tuff ring. This is volcanism that happens under a shallow lake. So this whole area was covered with shallow lakes. And uh, when a volcano erupts in shallow water, it sends debris out in all directions, making a ring. And the ring is of a rock that we call tuff, T-U-F-F. So Fort Rock is considered a tuff ring. This was a volcano that erupted under shallow seawater, and now it's covered with sagebrush. So talk about a big change in climate here to turn this from a shallow sea, very shallow lake, a very large lake, like, like an inland sea, to turning it into desert. Okay, Newberry Volcano, as I said, was the youngest one in this group. And uh, if you look at Newberry in the distance, where's the volcano? <laughs> you don't see it. It is a shield volcano. So it's not a stratocone volcano like Mount Hood, and Mount Jefferson, and so forth. It's actually called a shield volcano. These are like Hawaiian type volcanoes. The lava is so runny that it doesn't make a, a, a cone that sticks up. It makes kind of a long, low, broad, pro, uh, long, low profile, broad based volcano that if you didn't know that was a volcano, you, you would look at that in the distance. You, you know, most people wouldn't recognize that as a volcano. If we get up to the top of Newberry though, uh, then we can see uh, what was uh, sort of like Crater Lakes. There's, there's a couple of craters right in the top of it. And we've got East Lake and Paulina Lake. And then this here area here is the big obsidian flow. So these are volcanic, this, this is a volcanic center and this is the youngest of that. Now I'm gonna explain all this or come up with an explanation for why it's older at one end and younger at the other when I put together, when you watch the presentation at the end. I have a pre-recorded presentation where I put Oregon together and this will come to life for you. So just kind of keep it in your mind here and we'll move on. This is the big obsidian flow. So you can see East Lake and Paulina Lake. And here we're looking at an aerial view of this. Obsidian is volcanic lava that just cooled immediately and it doesn't form rock because it cooled so quickly, it forms glass, volcanic glass. And so this is one of the largest uh, areas that has obsidian in the Western United States. Obsidian was prized by Native Americans, as you might know, for arrowheads and weaponry. So this was a strategic place. Uh, Lava Butte is a parasitic cone. Now this is a little cinder cone and a cinder cone is much smaller than a shield volcano, but this is also associated with the, the volcanism in Newberry. And then of course, this area is known for lava. And so we have wonderful caves here, but these caves are not like limestone caves. They didn't form from groundwater dissolving the rock underneath their lava tubes where lava was flowing through an area and then the outside of it cooled and hardened and the liquid lava flowed through leaving a cavity. So a lot of the caves that we have in central Oregon are actually lava tubes. Okay, we'll move on to the next area, which is the basin and range. And basin and range, the name says it all. It's mountain ranges with basins in between them, a whole series of it. Now let's take a look at this. Uh, when, when we have, here we have a series of parallel mountain ranges with basins in between them. So the geologist's word for this, uh, this is due to earthquake faults. And when, earth, when, when the ground gets stretched like this, certain blocks, so the crust gets stretched, certain block, earthquake faults develop and certain blocks drop down while others remain standing up. We call the uplifted, up, uh, lifted block, we call it a horst, and the down drop block, we call it a graben. So geologists will refer to this as horsts and grabens. Let's take a look at what it really looks like. And you might have, you might be familiar with the beautiful Steens Mountains 
in this part of Oregon. And we've got the Steens as a wonderful example of an upthrown block. It just stayed up while the basin area, the Albert Desert in the foreground dropped down. Now you might ask yourself, how does this happen? How did this area of Oregon become stretched? Stretched so much that cracks developed and certain pieces stayed up while other blocks dropped down. Well, it, we find out uh, that it's due to Oregon rotating. So we've, we've done uh, several studies of Oregon using GPS stations and planted in the ground and they track the motion of Oregon. So not only do we have all the subduction going on off our coast, but North America, which Oregon is on, is actually tearing apart from itself right here and Western Oregon is rotating clockwise around a central point here in Eastern Oregon. And so we think that this pulling away, this area here pulling away from places like Nevada and Idaho, the mainland of North America is causing this area to be stretched. And, uh, and so when that, like I said, when that stretching happens and the crust gets thinner, cracks develop and, and it can't do anything but just have certain, it's being pulled apart. You can see the arrows and the direction that it's pulling apart and that's causing these blocks to drop down. So this is where we get, we call those normal faults because it's, it's due to extension. If we look at Southern Oregon here in the basin and range area, and this, this basin and range topography, there's just a little piece of it in Southern Central Oregon, but, uh, but most of the state of Nevada is also basin and range. So this, the basin and range area actually reaches all the way down into California and almost to, into Mexico. So a little portion of it, it, that's the whole west coast of, Oregon, of, of North America is really detaching and causing some to stay up while others drop down. So we can see that the Steens Mountains here are an uplifted block where the Albert Desert is a downdrop block. The Catlow Valley is a downdrop block. These are the basins and here's the ranges. Now what shapes these area? Well, the, the area during the ice ages, uh, this, we did not have glaciers over us in any part of Oregon, did not have ice sheets over us, but we certainly were affected and our climate was certainly affected by the ice ages. So during the last ice age, it, this area was heavily glaciated. So if we look at the Kiger Gorge here, which is in the Steens Mountains, you can see this beautiful U-shaped valley. A U-shaped valley just cries out to the geologist as that is the result of glaciation. So those high mountains in the Blue Mountains that we talked about and the higher mountains in the basin and range were all under the effects of having glaciers. Another effect of having glaciers was extreme rainfall in areas that are now desert. So if we look at this portion of Oregon, we have a picture here of Oregon and you can see Southeastern Oregon here blown up. And this is, uh, um, we have, all of these areas were lakes. Here's Fort Rock that I showed you and the lake that was around it. Uh, up, up in almost, this is considered the high lava plains through here. But the basin and range had a lot of these huge lakes. All that's left, Summer Lake is drying up. So the black areas are lakes that still have water in them today. But the yellow shows the extent of these, uh, how much bigger these lakes were during the ice ages. We call these pluvial lakes, rainfall. And they, they're just basically collections of rainfall. So when you go out to this area, we're going to look at a, uh, Lake Abert here, and and um, and I, I'm not sure a, a couple of these others that are existing today. Oh, Upper Kalamath Lake is another one. Uh, you can see that they're just shallow lakes. Let's look at uh, Lake Abert here, and you can see that there's not much of a shoreline. It's just basically what's left of a gigantic puddle that formed during the last ice age, and it's in the process of drying up because. We're not getting all that rainfall in this area anymore. 
Okay, so then we'll move on from there to this location. We'll look at this Oahe Plateau. Now, some people consider this uh, the part of the basin and range area. We'll look at it. It's, it, it, it is very similar in its structure and, and in its, uh, the way it's formed that is very similar to the basin and range area, but it has something else that's kind of interesting. It has a huge crater that we believe is part of the marching of the Yellowstone hotspot. Let me explain. Okay, so here we have the Oahe area of Oregon, this very remote southeastern corner of Oregon, and we have McDermott Crater here, a very large crater explosion. And then we have a series of explosive volcanoes until we get to where Yellowstone is today. And we believe that that's due to a hotspot. And if you're not familiar with hotspots, think about Hawaiian Islands are another example of a hotspot. A hotspot is a hot place in the Earth's crust that brings up volcanism. And so a volcano will come up and erupt, but the moving plate is moving over it. So a series, as the plate moves, a series of volcanoes keeps coming up. And the oldest one is the first one and they get progressively younger. Again, that age progression. This fascinates geologists because we, there, that means something. So the very oldest, uh, it, the, here we have an A progression going this way to where Yellowstone is under the hotspot today. You might be familiar with Yellowstone or you might have heard that Yellowstone it was a, an enormous eruption, much bigger than anything uh, in Oregon in its day. And it's the result of where the hotspot is today. But there's a whole series of craters and they get progressively older as you go this direction. The oldest one is McDermott Crater. So what did we have in Oregon? We have an age progression going up to Yellowstone hotspot, but we also have an age progression in the high lava plains that goes the other direction. And again, I hope to put that together for you when I do my collage at the end of this presentation. So hang on. Okay, uh, one of the things that it did is it, it blocked up, it caused enormous lava flows that blocked up this area here. The Snake River was trying to escape and get over to the Pacific Ocean, but it got blocked here by lava flows. And so it formed this enormous, what we call Lake Idaho in this portion. Now this is Oregon right here. And this is southeast, southern Idaho, the Snake River Plain runs through here, but this whole area was a large lake that was made from the, the, the damming up of the Snake River. And we'll look at the Rome beds. So this part of Oregon, if you ever get a chance to visit here, this is a wonderful place to go visit. They call this the Rome beds. I'll show you a picture of it. It looks like it looked like you know uh, ancient Rome to the first people that that came here. But what it is is the lake bed sediments. So you can see these layers here, these continuous lateral layers that run across, just cries out that this is lake sediment that that formed. And then the rainwater has gotten in here, cracks formed, and it has eroded away into these. So this is sometimes called the pillars of Rome. But what it is, is ancient lake bed sediments from Lake Idaho. Okay, so anyway, uh, the, you know, there's a, there's a lot to see in Oregon and a lot of different things. Okay, let's move on to, let's talk a little bit more about that lava, the gigantic lava flows. Let me go back for just a minute. Block this part of Oregon, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, you can see the Oregon-Washington border here and the current Snake River going through, but the Snake River got blocked here, forming this Lake Idaho and uh, giving rise to the Rome beds. But where did this lava come from? Let's go back to the lava here. And the lava comes from cracks that formed. Now, uh, this portion of Oregon is called the Deschutes Columbia Plateau. And it's part of a much larger feature that, that goes into Washington called the Columbia, the, the Plateau of the Columbia River. 
and it's enormous volumes of lava. So let me show you what the Columbia River, this is, makes the rocks we call the Columbia River Basalt Group. This is one of the largest flows of lava that we've ever had on Earth, an enormous outpouring. What happened is, and, and we're not totally sure of the cause of this, we think it has something to do with the Yellowstone hotspot, but it also could have something to do with the rotation of Oregon but we're, we developed all these cracks right here in this region, and it issued out when you crack the Earth's surface, that, that thin lava, that runny Columbia River uh, basalt lava just flows out of these enormous fissures or cracks in the ground. And so you can see here uh, a picture of Hawaii and what it might look like, what it might have looked like on an enormous scale. And then we have here in this picture, I have this, these are some of the cracks that solidified. The lava flowed away. And so they're standing up in relief. The, these were the source. And these, all the source area for this is right in here in this funny corner between Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. One of the largest flows on earth. Now, uh, this lava is called the Columbia River basalt because it made use of the Columbia River. It flowed and it made the, it poured over enormous parts of Washington. Parts of it stick down into Oregon, the Deschutes Columbia Plateau. And then it flowed down the Columbia River and it actually makes its way all the way to the ocean. So uh, we'll, we'll see that here in a minute. This picture isn't showing it making it all the way to the ocean, but it does. And it actually forms the hills within the Willamette Valley. So this lava is covered an enormous area. This is an older map of it. Let's see what we've modified it now because we found out the source area was actually much larger and the extent covered. So this is the new model of with the Columbia River basalts. Again, originating right here, making the Columbia uh, Plateau of Washington, sticking down into Oregon, making the Deschutes Plateau, covering up the Blue Mountains, those older rocks, pouring down the uh, Columbia River all the way to the coast and forming our beautiful headlands of the coast and forming hills within the Willamette Valley. So I've got a picture here of the beautiful Willamette Valley with some hills here. These hills are this lava, okay? Hills sticking up in the Willamette Valley are Columbia River basalt. It also forms the beautiful Cape Lookout, many of the capes along the Oregon coast. And this lava, this is amazing because lava, there, there's so much lava that it didn't cool. It was a, you know, if you see a little bit of lava pouring out on the ground, like I had the privilege of seeing in Hawaii, it cooled right before my eyes, but it was just a very thin little layer that was coming down. These were enormous layers, some of them over a hundred feet thick. And um, so uh, it, it, all in all, it was enough lava to build this gigantic wall if you can imagine a wall that is one mile high, two miles wide, that would circle the entire globe. That's the volume of lava that was coming out of those cracks. Well, that fills up the Columbia River Plateau. They, they, some of these flows were 100 feet thick, a series of individual flows. And they were so thick that they couldn't, that they didn't cool. Yes, the outside of it crusted over, but inside there was so much liquid pushing it, it would break through its own crust and move across the landscape. So we see these Columbia River plat, uh, basalt lavas, the Columbia River basalt, just all over Oregon. It's the most common rock. It's the rock that we use for our roads and uh, our gravel is most common rock in Oregon, and yet it's not native to this part of Oregon. It actually came from cracks over on the Idaho border. It, uh, amazing, you know, just amazing stuff. Okay, you can see the nature of it here in the Deschutes Plateau. You can see the nature of all these uh, mesa areas, these high tabletop regions that is basalt. In fact, all of this is basalt, hundreds of feet of it. 
in some places. In fact, in Yakima, Washington, three miles of lava. That's how deep, three miles underground, that's all lava. Uh, so enormous volumes. Okay, it makes beautiful columns as you might see when you look, when you go down the Columbia River Gorge and you can see all the beautiful waterfalls of Multoma Falls, it's all the same lava and it makes these beautiful column shapes here. And that's due to shrinkage when the lava cools. Okay, so it's all about lava. In fact, all of Oregon's about lava. Let's talk about the backbone, the spine of Oregon, and that's the Cascades. And the Cascades are, there's two different portions of the Cascades, two different ranges, and sometimes we like to break those up. We have the older Western Cascades here, that's in the, uh, next to us in the Willamette Valley. But then we have to the east, we have the high Cascades. So I'll talk about each one of those individually. Why two different mountain ranges? Uh, well, it all has to do with subduction. Subduction is what creates the mountain ranges. Off our shore of Oregon, we have the Juan de Fuca Plate, which is subducting and moving towards North America and diving under us. When it gets to a certain depth of 60 miles below the surface, it starts melting rock. And that molten rock becomes magma, which rises to the surface. And if it erupts, then we call it lava, it's the same stuff, liquid rock making its way to the surface and making the cascades. So why do we have a change in here? Uh, well, it's in, in the, if you notice the angle, the, the plate is different. So when the angle of the plate is much steeper, you reach that depth of 60 miles a little closer to the shoreline. And that was what was happening with when the Western Cascades formed. And then the plate changed. It started probably slowing down and it's not subducting quite so steeply anymore. And so that's pushing the volcanism farther to the east. And that's making the high Cascades of today. So again, if you go back and you look, the Western Cascades are in the Western portion of the range. And that was when the plate was going down at a much steeper angle. Now it's getting shoved in farther. And so it's going in farther East before it makes the high Cascades. And these are the active volcanoes that we're familiar with. The Western Cascades are a low range of mountains. So here I've got Mount Jefferson in the background. And that's part of the high Cascades, but all of these mountains in the foreground, these are the older eroding Western Cascades. They were every, big, every bit as big and dynamic as our Cascades are today, but they are much older and they've eroded down. Now I had a, a student from PSU that put together this nice little diagram to show you this. And so I'd like to show it to you here. If you're in the Willamette Valley and you're looking towards the Cascades and you wanna see the high peak of say Mount Hood or, or Mount Jefferson, you have to look over all the older Western Cascades because you're down here at a low elevation and you have to look over all of them before you see the high Cascades. If you're on the other side of the, of the Cascades in the, what, the uh, Central Oregon, the part that we call the high desert, you're looking right at them. They're unobstructed and you're seeing those beautiful high cascades. So let me show you the, uh, a, a picture of what the Western Cascades, well, I showed you here, you can see the Western Cascades are these low blue hills in the foreground and then the high cascades beyond it. Okay, and then of course, uh, you know, there's there's this whole trend of, of small hills that at the estu, uh, at the eastern margin of the Willamette Valley, and those mark the earliest eruptions of that western Cascades. Okay, and then let's talk about the high Cascades. This is the part of Oregon that you are familiar with, uh, or this is the part of the Cascades that you think of when you think of the Cascades. Nobody can think of Portland without Mount Hood in the backdrop. Okay, uh, Portland happens to be the only US city built in a volcanic field because not only does it have the beautiful Mount Hood in the background, but you see all these hills in the Portland area, those too are volcanoes. 
a different kind of volcanoes. That's a, that's a, a different origin altogether, but we've got a series of all inactive volcanoes that we've now built the civity around, but Portland is, uh, Mount Hood makes a beautiful backdrop for Portland. Let's go to another view of Mount Hood. You can see from Lost Lake area, and again, beautiful. Now, why is Mount Hood so pointed like that? It's because it's been ever, it hasn't erupted in a while. And so those glaciers are working and carving it into the beautiful iconic peak that it is today. Uh, same thing with Mount Jefferson. You can see Mount Jefferson was heavily glaciated. And so the glaciers work to tear it down and make the very sharp pointed peak. This is a view of Mount Jefferson, not uh, looking over, uh, you know, you can, just looking right at it. You're not looking over the Western Cascades here. Okay, and then of course the High Cascades, uh, Three Sisters, are, and you can see that these are very active volcanoes. Of course, uh, Mount St. Helens was, is also in the High Cascades, even though it's in Washington. The High Cascades run all the way through Washington and even down into California. And as you know, it was very active just 42 years ago. Uh, so it had its last eruption. Now the three sisters are showing signs, the South sister are showing signs of rumbling. You can see this picture taken by the USGS shows a very fresh lava flow right up here. So there's a lot of activity going on in the Cascades today. And then of, of course the beautiful iconic Crater Lake uh, is, is a volcano that had such a large eruption. This was 7,000 years ago, had such a large eruption that the, the whole inside of it collapsed in on itself and they filled up with water and made the beautiful iconic Crater Lake. It's still an active volcano. There's still activity going on. Wizard Island is popping up from underneath. And if you look under the water there, you can see a couple other cones. So this is what volcanoes do, these kind of volcanoes. They blow themselves up in an enormous eruption. In this case, the whole top of it collapsed in on itself, forming Crater Lake. But as long as that magma is there, and as long as subduction going on creating that magma, there's still activity there. So you, we could see another eruption in the future of Crater Lake. OK, and then. Uh, second to last is the Willamette Valley, and that's the part of Oregon I'm sure you're most familiar with because it is uh, it, it occupies this region between the Cascades, the Western and the High Cascades, and the Coast Range, and so we're kind of wedged in there. The Willamette River did not carve out its own valley, so this isn't a car. This is the Willamette River just occupies the low spot that was that's here, and the low spot is here because we have the High Cascades over here, or the and the Western Cascades, and then we have the Coast Range being pushed up, and so the Willamette Valley is actually sinking, and the Willamette River conveniently occupies that low spot. So as you know, the Willamette Valley was host to these enormous floods, which is what the Ice Age Flood Institute is all about, studying the effects of these. And this is the beautiful picture of, uh, this is Photoshop, but this is what downtown Portland would look like if the Missoula floods were to hit today. And I'm sure you folks all are very aware of this situation. Uh, we look at the beautiful soils, though, and the, the reason that this is such a highly agricultural area is because of the Missoula floods, because the water backed up into the Willamette Valley, and it stayed here for a while before it could drain out the Columbia River. And in that time, all those sediments that were washed from eastern, or, uh, eastern Washington all that dirt, all that debris in the water settled down and made a beautiful thick sequence of soil that we farm today. When the early settlers were coming west, they skipped over that part of Eastern Washington, the calling it the channeled scablands because it looked like it had just been torn up and scarred and all of that dirt was deposited here in the Willamette Valley. When they came here to the Willamette Valley, they thought, this is for me, this is farm country. This, we've got this enormous thick sequence of, uh, of silt that 
that developed. Okay, and glacial erratics, as, as I'm sure you're all very aware of. Uh, and a lot of these in the Willamette Valley are drop stones. Uh, they dot the whole Willamette Valley floor is dotted with these gigantic stones that came from as far away as Montana. They were incorporated in the ice. When the ice dam broke, it washed down the Columbia River, backed up into the Willamette Valley, and there were icebergs floating around carrying a cargo of stone. And then they would, <coughs> excuse me, they would beach up in a certain area there and, and they, they would kind of, you know, hit bottom there and sit there and melt and then the stone would drop out. So we've got these all over. They, they are called erratics because they were brought in by icebergs floating in here. Okay, and of, of course, um, in addition to giving us the beautiful soil, we also have a wonderful fossil record of animals that lived during the ice ages. Now, these are much more modern than dinosaurs. These are mammals, uh, the woolly mammoth and the mastodon and the uh, gigantic Harlan ground sloth and so forth. All of these animals that are extinct today, but we find a rich assemblage of fossils right here in the Willamette Valley. Okay, and last but not least is our coast range. Our, our, so that was the last place to form the Oregon Coast Range. Now the Oregon Coast Range is not as high as the uh, Western Cascades or the High Cascades, but it's got some high spots in it. So the very highest spot in the Oregon Coast Range is Mary's Peak, which you can see nicely. And this is a view from the west looking at it. Normally you see Mary's Peak the up from the other direction from the Willamette Valley, but this is a piece of the coast range of, uh, it's actually a volcanic sill that was pushed up. And so that's why it's extra high while everything else, the sandstone around it has eroded away. So this is the tallest point in the uh, coast range. We look at the second tallest point is Saddle Mountain. And this is again, some of that Columbia River basalt that flowed through the uh, coast range and makes up the, it, it's a really resistant rock. It doesn't weather. So everything else weathers around it and then it becomes the high spot. So, uh, so these two, these two high places in the coast range were armored by igneous rock that, that came up from below and then was more erosion resistant. So everything else around it eroded. And that's why we've got those extra high places. But the coast range isn't all about volcanic rock at all. It's just, it's just armored with little places, discrete locations that have igneous rock. The rest of it is sedimentary rock, sandstone. And I'll show you the origin of the coast range here in a minute. If you look at a picture of just the ordinary coast range here, you can see that they're just mild-mannered mountains here. Beautiful, uh, beautiful to look at. They're heavily forested because of all the rain that we get here, but they're, but they're not as dynamic and not as sharp peaks as we saw on the Blue Mountains or the Klamath Mountains or in the Cascades. Uh, the coast range, of course, has the coast. And this is one of my favorite spots. This is Hug Point along the coast. This was an old stagecoach road that they were walking on and sometimes it's underwater depending on what the tide is doing. It's interesting. And another beautiful picture of Boiler Bay here, we can see along the Oregon coast, we can see how pieces of ocean floor have been shoved up. See how these layers are tilted here. And then we have flat lying layers on top of them. So this shows the subduction is taking this, scraping up the bottom of the ocean floor and then pushing it onto land. We look at, if we look at a cross section here, a diagram, we see what the coast range really is. The coast range is an igneous block of accreted terrain, actually, this block called Silesia, but it's buried under all this uh, sediments that have been scraped up. And then we have the Klamath Mountains in the south, but in the north, this was a uh, large, um, what do you call this, uh, kind of a, 
a large amount of sedimentary rock poured out. Let me let me show you here in a minute. So we had so let's see. Uh, I, I lost the. <laughs> having a senior moment, I can't remember uh, what this is called right now. But uh, what we had is we had the Celestia block under uh, pushed underneath us and that the Klamath Mountains and they were eroding and they formed here a uh, this submarine fan. That's what uh, that's the word I was looking for, a delta. And, and a, a delta pours out sediments. So here we have um, here we have a map of Oregon today showing the present day location of Eugene, Salem, and Portland. It was all underwater. The Klamath Mountains were here because they were older. They were eroding into this bay, but this was a large embayment here. The shoreline was way over here by um, at the edge of the Western Cascades. Okay, so everything that we know of as the Willamette Valley and the Coast Range didn't exist. The beginning of the Coast Range was made from sediments, except for places where it's armored with igneous rock. The, bay, the majority of the Coast Range is made from sediments that were shedding down the Klamath Mountains, from the Klamath Mountains into this bay and creating what we call a submarine fan. If we look a little fast forward in time, this gets lifted up. And so this is forming the coast range. We still have the Klamath Mountains here. Eugene, Salem, and Portland were still underwater at this time, but there was a bay. That, so the ocean, the mountains were starting to form. They're getting pushed up by subduction. Uh, they're not creating volcanoes like in the Cascades, but it's just taking those sediments and Wed, uh, pushing them upwards, kind of squishing them together and pushing them upwards. And so that's making the coast range. Uh, if we fast, then the coast range is shedding sediments into this bay, so is the Cascades. And so eventually it becomes the Willamette Valley. And we've got the Willamette Valley with Portland, Salem, and Eugene. We're looking from the Northwest and we're looking towards the Southeast here. And we can see the Klamath Mountains down here in Southern Oregon. And we can see the Coast Range forming here. So there's all these submarine fans, which are just wedges of sediments that have been lifted up. Okay, so if we look at uh, that and we wanna summarize, we just looked at each place, physiographic province of Oregon. Let's see if we can summarize it. Oregon's geology, geologic history is all about volcanoes, and it's not just the Cascades, it's volcanism of all different types. So the accreted terrains of the Blue Mountains and the Klamaths were formed by volcanoes originally. They were moved over and accreted onto North America, and then they were stitched together by lava that came up and kind of came up in the accretion process. Lava is created and comes up and kind of stitches those areas together. We call those stitching plutons. Um, the high lava plains right in the center of the state. What else can I say? That's, that's all lava. That's all a series of explosive volcanoes with an age progression. The Deschutes Columbia Plateau is all lava. Okay, and even the mild mannered coast range, which is not volcanic, is built on a block of volcanic material. And then, of course, all the hills that we see within the Willamette Valley are lava, part of that lava. So if you had, if you could take one geologic process and summarize all of Oregon, it would be all about volcanoes of one type or another. So I want to uh, end this part of the presentation here, but I'd like to uh, show you a collage of how we put the state together. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, several years ago, Bill Orr and I teach uh, co-teach a class at, at uh, Portland State University, and it's all about Oregon, the geology of Oregon. So we made this film in the collage for that uh, class, uh, but I'd like to show it to you now because it's me putting together an old-fashioned felt board and putting the pieces of Oregon on 
piece by piece the way that they all formed. And so I'd like to take a minute here and switch over to that. So give me just a second here. And let's see if I can get that up here. Okay. Can you all see uh, the felt board? Let me know, nod your head if you're seeing. Yes. Yeah, you are seeing it. Okay, good. Okay, so I am going to uh, share this. Let's see, I didn't check the sound. Okay, sound looks okay. Sound of my computer is up. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. My name is Bill Orr. And I'm Sheila Alson. And I have been teaching oh. geology at the college level for over 50 years, most of it in Oregon, not all of it, but most of it in Oregon. The course you've just taken, and we want to kind of summarize a little bit. So what we'd like to do is you've been watching and going through the course, G341, uh, and you've been studying about each physiographic province on its own separately. So what we'd like to do here is put together rather a loose chronology, but a somewhat accurate representation of how the state came to be piece by piece. So we're gonna start with the oldest province, which you know is the Blue Mountains. And I've got a picture of it here. I have an old fashioned felt board that we're gonna to put together the state on. And uh, the Blue Mountains is made as a creeded terrain, as you know. So those are pieces of land, chunks of land that came from all the way over towards Asia, broke off the continent, and through the motions of plate tectonics, moved over and accreted onto the North American continent. The shoreline at that time was over here, which is in Idaho today. And so these uh, pieces came over, these foreign pieces of different rock and definitely the oldest rock in the state. And they attached right here. Now notice that I've got these as a collection of several terrains. So several chunks of land actually accreted together before they attached onto the continent. So we say that they are amalgamated. And they are made of the Banker terrain, the Wallawa terrain, Icy and Old Sperry, a collection of pieces of different origins, different geologic origins came together and then attached. Okay, the second oldest part of the state is the Klamath Mountains. And so we, we see the Klamath Mountains today over in the opposite corner of the state. But I want to show you that it's a little different than the Blue Mountains. It again is similar in that it's accreted terrains, but we've got a little different structure here. We have the first, these terrains accreted in a particular order. So we had the first one here attached, and then the second one was shoved under it, and the third one, the fourth, there were several of them that were shoved in underneath, kind of like shingles on a roof. Okay, so we've got, and now they are interesting because they were attached. We have evidence, uh, uh, in a, which I will explain later, that we think that they actually accreted to the continent here. And then you have to ask yourself why today they're way over here at the opposite end of the state. Okay, that, you know, so what's going on here? Okay, well, we know that extension is going on in the basin and range area, which is our next province, and I'll put it here. And I actually omitted the Oahe terrain, which would be right here. And just to simplify things, I made it part of the basin and range because the uh, process is very similar in both cases. This area has been stretched to at least twice its original width. So we think in the stretching of the basin and range that that puts the Klamaths over here in this portion of the state. The state is also rotating and we see evidence of it rotating in a clockwise fashion 
around a central point right about here, about Pendleton. And so uh, that, that would explain why we have stretching here, we have strike slip faults running across here, and then we have compression up here in the Yakima Coal Belt. Okay, uh, so that's one idea for how it got to the other opposite corner of the state, basin and range. Okay, then I wanna talk about the high lava plains. We'll put those in, they fit in right here. And they are interesting because they are an age progression, meaning that we have the oldest volcanics in this province are uh, right here in this end of the Eastern end. And then as we move towards the West, the volcanics get younger and younger. So the youngest one is found right here in the uh, Newberry caldera is the youngest one of them. So we call this an age progression. Now we don't, it's a little unclear of the origin of this high lava plains. It's definitely volcanics and very explosive volcanics. We think it has to do with the Yellowstone hotspot. So the Yellowstone hotspot, as you know, kind of appears uh, in this area here. Originally, we see evidence of it, but it marches across the Snake River Plain in Idaho and go, and it's currently the hotspot is residing underneath uh, Wyoming, where it is today. But we think something happened here that kind of took the top off that mantle plume and kind of smeared the lava back in this direction as the rest of the plate, you know, is moving over here. So we had kind of a blob of magma here that's being smeared back the other way. That's, that's one explanation and maybe the simplest one that I can come up with for the extreme explosiveness and volcanic activity of the high lava plains. Okay, right about this time, we also see the Western Cascades appearing. So our oldest of the Cascade range are now eroded down and they reside in about this location. Okay, today these have cities like Staten and Silverton and, and Scotts Mills and so forth are here in the Western Cascades. These were every bit as dynamic as our high Cascades are today. They're just older and the volcanism has shifted uh, to the east, and so they they are eroded down. Okay, right about this time, I want to put up this piece, which which represents the Clarno and the John Day formations, which are very important. They're not a physiographic province of their own, but they are they are a significant influence on what happened in this part of the state. And so uh, we've got ash layers, extreme ash layers, and, and also lahar material from the Clarno and ash from the John Day Formation that covers this entire region here. Okay, now what's the significance of this? It preserves an astounding fossil record that's really almost unparalleled anywhere to see a complete uh, sequence of, of, uh, of animals being preserved in this area and plants and so forth. So the Clarno formation and then the younger John Day formation. It turns out that we used to think that the Clarno formation or that the John Day was part of the Cascades. So, you know, this was ash that was dumped on an area and preserved an amazing array of fossils. And where did that ash come from? We originally thought maybe it came from the Western Cascades because they were pumping ash and the prevailing wind is to the east. And so that made sense. But when they started mapping it, they noticed that there was a gap here. There was the cascades here, and then there was a bit of a gap before you get to these formations. So it was only recently recognized that the actual source of the John Day uh, formation is a, the Crooked River Caldera, which is in the high lava plains. And it was with the discovery of that that, that brought to light this whole area here. And this uh, covers up, this is considered part of the Blue Mountains. 
Okay, another part piece that is not its own formation, but still noteworthy is the Taiyi Delta. So let's take a look at what the coastline looked like at that time. So we've got most of the state built here and all this is land, but we've got this area here left remaining that is still ocean at this time. Now the Klamaths are doing what mountains do. They erode and they shed their sediments into this embayment that was here. And so they form what we call a delta. We call this the Taiyi Delta. And these sediments are very, they're from the eroding Klamaths. Now, the reason we thought the Klamaths originally were over here is because we find muscovite flakes in the Taiyi sandstone that developed from the Delta. And those muscovite flakes are related to volcanic activity in the Idaho batholith. And so that's our explanation for why they accreted when they created originally, they were adjacent to Idaho, but now through the stretching of the brace and the range, they're put over in this area and they're shedding their sediments into the western part of the state. Now this, because we have subduction going on off our shores, which are making the western cascades, we have an accretionary wedge that is being folded up I kind of imagine it being folded upward like this, and that forms the coast range. Put up the coast range there. Okay, so a lot of the there's underlying basalt underneath the coast range, then there's the Taiyi Delta and all kinds of sediments on top of it. And all the lifts becomes the mountains of the coast range. Now, right about this time, we noticed a shift in the volcanism from the Western Cascades. So the Western Cascades were doing their thing and they were eroding away, filling sediments into what is going to become the Willamette Valley. But the volcanism gets shifted at some point here to the east and it becomes the high peaks of the Cascades that we know today. So we're going to treat these two provinces as if they're two, the older Western Cascades and the younger High Cascades. Okay, now right about this time, we had cracks uh, developing about 15 million years ago. We think related to the hotspot, the Yellowstone hotspot, but we had cracks that developed along the Idaho Oregon border and even up into Washington, huge cracks that issued enormous volumes of lava. We call that lava the Columbia River basalt. And they, they pour out of dikes in this area and then they cover the landscape because this is a different volcanism than the high cascades. The lava is thinner and it runs almost like a syrup. And so it fills up the valleys and then runs down. We call it the Columbia River basalts because it uses the Columbia River as a conduit to make its way over towards the coast. And so we see these lavas, they make up today our Deschutes Columbia Plateau. Most of that is in Washington, but there's a little portion of it in Oregon. It actually fills up in the Willamette Valley and becomes the hills within the Willamette Valley. So we have the Amity Hills, the Eola Hills, the Salem Hills. That's as far south as they go. And those are hills of Columbia River basalt that stick up uh, because they were filled in by this lava and then everything around it eroded away. This lava we find going all the way down the Columbia River, and we can see it here in Astoria, and then put on this one here. And we also find it as the headlands along the coast going all the way as far south as Seal Rock. So we have, you know, this lava coming in, it made its way through the western Cascades and through uh, through Intercanyon Valleys, through the Cascades, it filled up underneath the Willamette Valley. And then, uh, yes, some of the lava did go out the river. I think a lot of it actually made its way through the coast range because we find it here on the coast as well. Okay, now this is a 
for our basin, the Willamette Valley, because we have subduction going on, which is creating the cascades. And we have an accretionary wedge that's kind of stopping sediments from going all the way out to the ocean. So these sediments are eroding and becoming the Willamette Valley. Now, the last piece of the story is the Missoula floods. And that's what creates the Willamette Valley today. So we had at the Missoula floods, 15,000 years ago during the last ice ages, there was a large ice uh, dam that uh, blocked a river in, um, in the Missoula, Montana area. So we call that the Missoula floods. That ice dam broke and sent waves of water down across the Columbia Plateau and into, it actually backed up into the Willamette Valley. So we had 400 feet of water here carrying all the sediments from Eastern Washington into this area and giving us the fixed sequence of the farmland that we have today. So that's a, a basic chronology, a very simple but somewhat accurate chronology of how the state was formed piece by piece. When I came to Oregon in 1958, we could see this wonderful puzzle, but we if you move from one area to another area, it's like you've gone into a different world. If you move from the Klamaths into the Cascades, they're totally different. And it was really confusing, very difficult to decipher. Then in the mid 60s, we uh, revisited this idea of continental drift. We've dressed it up now as plate tectonics. And all of a sudden, it was the puzzle. It was, it was the, the solution to this complex puzzle. Uh, plate tectonics answers all these questions for us. It was amazing going through that period of time, uh, what was complicated, a wonderfully complicated puzzle. And then all of a sudden the solutions are right there because of a simple idea, and that is moving continents or uh, accreting continents that came to be. It helped uh, solve this vexing problem. All of us in the Department of Geology uh, here at Portland State and at, at the University of Oregon and PSU, uh, we're, we're puzzled by this, and we all had the same impression when the plate tectonics came along. Uh, it was the answer to everything, what we'd call our Rosetta Stone, if you wish, the solution. Okay, so we hope you enjoyed the presentation, and I hope that you uh, appreciate the wonderful diversity that's here in Oregon and uh, why this is such a great uh, state to study geology. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I hope, uh, and, that, and that concludes our presentation. So uh, I hope the sound quality was sufficient. I, uh, I, I've never had it. Um, did you guys hear okay? Yes. You did? Yes, I, I think it was all right. Oh, okay. I yeah. worried about it the whole time. Maybe I, I wasn't hearing it as clearly as I usually do. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I thought, uh, and we had a little streaming difficulty right at the beginning, which I've never had, but good. Okay. So uh, I'm here to take questions and I'm going to stop sharing at this point, screen sharing, and I'd be glad to take questions. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, I see that there's one in the chat box, and 